Welcome back. Next, we'll be looking at function scoping within Q. So again, this is a concept that's common across other programming languages too. Um, so we've got a link here to a wiki page um, for some more general information on the concept of function scoping. Um, but at a high level, what it refers to is what view of your variables are available within a function during its execution. Um, so we've got either variables that can be defined locally or variables that can be defined globally. So first of all, looking at locally defined variables, we've seen this already. So when we have our declaration here of the variable at the beginning of the function with the square brackets, um, that's now defined in a local scope. And what this means is when we run this function, um, we're able to use that param1 within the function. So with this here, we're just doing a standard out printing statement and we're combining a, the string of the input parameter. So my input parameter is two, so I'm adding that on here. And then you can see I'm doing a execution here of a multiplication, which works fine. I get the, the message, I get the calculation, but if I try and access param1 outside of this function, I get this evaluation error with the name of the, the variable. So we're not able to access our locally defined variables in this way. So inside the function is known as the local scope, Outside here, where we're trying to access it, is the global scope. So another example of local variables are the intermediate values we define along the way. So in this function here, first of all, I'm defining a local um, variable called local, <laughs> um, assigning it to a value of 40 of two, then I'm printing it out again, and then I'm doing an addition here at the end. So if we try and access this outside of the function, again, we're not able to do that in the global scope. We can only use it within the local scope. So whether we pass in the parameter or we define our own variable within the function. Um, those are both two examples of locally defined variables. So in this example here, we're showing a function defined within a function and we're saying we have this variable within the function f called local to f. Um, and then we have a sub function called g and we try and use local to f variable. What happens is we can't, it's not, it's not recognized. So if we wanted to use this, we'd have to do one of these things. We could, first of all, stick this declaration in here so that G knows about local to F, um, or we could pass it in. So if we have local to F here, we can define G with a parameter here. So passed from F to G, and then we're passing in that local to F parameter in for use within G. So that's just something to note when you have nested functions. So have a go at this exercise. So it's creating a function to find the circumference of a, a circle. Um, and once you're happy with that, let's move on and look at global scope. So in this example here, we're showing again, just defining a variable locally. So nothing we haven't seen before. We have B and then we're multiplying B by X and X will be our, our six input here. We get 12, fine. Um, now, if we had B defined globally, which is outside the local scope. So, so we see here, we've got B defined as four above. And then inside the function, we're multiplying b by x. We can see that f has used the global declaration of b. So in here, if I change this to 5, for example, you can see I'm multiplying 1 by 5. Um, now, if I delete b from my local namespace, so this notation here I think is new to us. This is how we would delete a variable. So we're saying delete the name of the variable. And then from this back tick dot means it's our local namespace. Um, so B no longer exists. We're basically removing this declaration here and we try and run that function. It doesn't work. This function F um, is trying to use B, but B doesn't have any value. So if we did something like this, so if we assigned B to be 10, for example, you can see that the function is going to use the local declaration first. Then if the local declaration doesn't exist, it's going to use the global one, AKA five. Um, and then obviously when we delete it all together and there's no local one defined or global one defined, it doesn't know what it is. So it's important to note that order of operations. And we also have the option to define global variables from within our own function. And we can do it two ways. First way is using set. Um, and the second way is using double colon assignment. So we're showing this here um, with two examples. So we've got B and C. So first of all, getting rid of B and C from our local namespace. So we know we don't have it. And then in this function here, we're setting B to be 47 and then we're setting C to be 74. So if we only had a single colon here, 
that would just set it locally when we have the second colon that's setting it globally so when we run that we can see outside of the function we're able to access those variables so there are some nuances between these two implementations so if you try to use this double colon assignment to set a global variable of the same name as a local variable then you only actually update the local scope so i think that's better explained by this example here so we've got b set globally then within our local scope we're defining this to be seven and that's we're updating that globally and then we're doing a multiplication here um, using that b value and that's the return of our function so we'll see here we've input 10 um, then we're multiplying 10 by 7 which is 70 so you can see it's used this new locally defined b didn't use the old one and then you see if we check b afterwards we've actually updated b from 6 to 7. now with if we had actually defined b locally first within a function we can see something else happens so i've got b which is set to be 6 globally then within my function f i'm reassigning that locally to be 42 then i'm redefining b globally to be x so the attempt here is to redefine this value here globally and then i'm returning b so it's interesting what happens here when you're passing in 98 for example um what's returned from the function is b which is 98 so even you're, it's not using this 42 um locally defined variable is actually using the the 98 you're passing in um but when you check b b is still six so you haven't actually updated it globally so even though you're able to use that um, variable you've passed in in the function it hasn't set it globally so that's known as collision so that's something to watch out for um it can be a bit tricky um, and then we're asking here what would happen in this example if we used set to define the global variable from inside the function instead of using this double colon we can have a look at that solution and try it out just to understand it a bit better so in this example the local declaration won't get overwritten and you will get your variable set globally now so i'm passing in 98 as my x parameter um i have six before um i'm defining it locally to be 42 then i'm setting b to be um 98 and then i'm returning b so the b that's returned is 42 which is the local variable and then when I'm checking b globally you'll see that that's actually 98 which is what i set it to be here so they act a little bit differently there and just watch out for that um it's, it's quite an important point and it can be a bit tricky to get your head around and it's something that trips people up um especially when you're new to the language and if you're seeing a function behaving unexpectedly um it can often be related to scoping a lot of the time and it's something to check um you know have i used this variable um name locally as well as globally and am i trying to set it as both um within my function okay so this exercise here is asking you to create a function that stores the time that the function was last called at um, so have a go with that um, and then we'll move on to our final section in the functions module which is projections so we've seen projections throughout this module um, particularly we've seen how we create them when we've got less than the amount of required arguments needed for a function so just to recap here if we're doing two plus um, and we create a function called add two you'll see we're creating a projection here so if we looked at add two before we try and call it so if we just do add two you'll see here we get our projection back and we're able to pass a list to that projection so two has been added to every single value of the list let's look at using a primitive operator so first of all here we're just showing um, normal operation of primitive operators so either with infix or functional notation and then let's say we want to create our projection we can use infix notation like this or we can use functional notation like this with the square bracket and then we can create a projection using a lambda as well so we've got um this lambda x plus y we're able to say i just want to um create a projection from a function so i'm just passing one parameter here four 
and then my add for here will be a projection and then I could have passed that over an atom or a list to operate on. Okay, so let's say I didn't actually want to project on the first argument of a function, I wanted to project any argument. So how can we do that? So in this example here, we're showing, trying to use division to do this. So this is infix notation here. Um, and we can't do the, something like this. We're not able to um, use a primitive operator here to create a projection. Um, so to do that, we need to use functional notation. And you'll see that I define this function called half and I'm just leaving the first parameter blank, basically. So you just need to simply omit the argument that you want to project across. And just to note, obviously, like that, that didn't work here. If we had it the other way around, that would have worked. So that's just something to note. Um, it's okay to go, it works for the first argument of function, but when it's not the first argument, you need to use functional notation. Um, so the short exercise here, um, just testing that. So create a projection called mod seven that calculates the input modulo seven. So you can use your mod function um, that we've seen before to do that. So if you just can't remember what that is, you can head to your reference card and check out mod. So it'll be an extension of that. And then finally, applying projections. So again, we've seen this already. We've got our projections add nine A and add four. They look like this. And we're now able to pass this um, either an atom or a list um, and both options work. So that's just how we can actually apply them and they just look like normal functions. Okay, so have a go at the final exercise here. And thank you so much for listening to this module. Um, just to recap, it's been quite a lengthy module. We've done a lot here. We've looked at, you know, what are functions? We went into depth on function valence and the parameters. Um, and then also when we're defining in a function, um, you know, the rules around our parameters, our logic, how we can return from functions, some best practices around that. Then we also looked at our explicit versus implicit parameters. So remember, we've got our X, Y, and Z that we can use if we want to implicitly. Um, we know about function scoping we just looked at in this video. So whether we have um, our variables declared locally or globally, that can have an impact on the execution of our function. And then finally, we just looked at our projections. So as with other modules as well, don't forget, you can navigate up a level and go check out our corresponding exercises for some additional um, learning. And thanks for listening and hopefully I'll see you back in another module very soon.